Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 15th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss why the House should not concur with the Senate's budget and what the governor should include in the resulting special session call. Second, we discuss where the legislature, and specifically the House majority, needs to go from here. And third, we explain why we believe closing the Hillcorp $100 million loophole is both appropriate and won't adversely impact Alaska oil and gas investment and production levels. And now, let's join Michael. Weekly top three. Uh, we got a lot to cover, uh, and uh, I, I want to get into it. So we're going to start things off. It's pretty much inevitable at this point that there's going to be a special session. Now, whether or not it's the governor calling it for a fiscal plan or whether the House holds strong and we approach a government shutdown and we need to do it, there's going to be a, a some kind of special session. Uh, but you say that the governor needs to have some important language in there because that kind of stuff matters. We've talked about this in the past, but hit me with your thoughts on this. What kind of language does it need to be and why does it matter? I'll get there in just a second, but I want to talk for a moment just about special session. I, I listened to Ben's Ben Carpenter's session with you yesterday, yes, uh, last night. And the one thing in there that troubled me greatly was Ben's prediction that we wouldn't go to special session, that 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 the Senate would be able to peel off enough House members to concur in the Senate budget. And, and that's that's hugely troublesome for all the reasons you went through in the last segment. But but let me be very clear here. And, and I and I've got friends on both sides of the aisle and I'm and I'm talking as much to the House minority members as I am to the to the House majority members who might peel off. If you vote for concurrence, what you are doing is you're voting to fund government on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through what ICER's Matt Berman has called the most regressive tax ever. That's what you're doing. You're voting to tax middle and lower income Alaska families, let the top 20% off the hook and have no contribution from, from non-residents receiving income in Alaska. You're voting to, to fund government on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and for those in the minority that talk a lot about, oh, I'm here for working Alaska families, I'm going to stand up, I ran to stand up for working Alaska families, you are doing the exact opposite by concurring with the Senate's budget. The Senate's budget is a top 20% driven, we don't have to pay, we're going to force everybody, we're going to force middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for this budget. It's a top 20% driven budget, and you're just buying in to the, to the most regressive tax ever uh, if you vote for concurrence. Now, well, and, and you're giving in, and, and as we were talking about in the break, you're giving in to blackmail. You will set a precedent to where this will happen moving forward. There will be no, if because Stedman has shown that once he finds a tactic that works, he uses it every time. And this is what will happen every time. The Senate will hold on to their budget until the last two or three days of the session, drop it on you and say, take it or leave it. And people will cave every time. And the House of Representatives will no longer be a representative body. It will be basically a rubber stamp or, as they're saying now, a 40-member advisory committee. That's it. They won't They won't get a choice because once he finds it, he'll use that forever. And and as Rob Myers pointed out yesterday through his proposed amendments to, to, to strip out the crony capitalist 
uh, uh, stuff, the stuff where, you know, it's just, we're giving government money to private industry. So some we're, we're picking winners and losers, losers by giving money to private industry. So private industry doesn't have to raise it from the private sector. They just, you know, as long as they can convince, you know, 20, what is it? 21 plus 11 plus one, uh, then, you know, then they're, they're in heaven. We, we also will be giving in the house also will be giving in to a budget set by crony capitalists. That's full of, of, of crony capitalism and full of, of government picking winners and losers right. uh, in the private sector. So it's just, I mean, it's, we got, we've got two bodies in the legislature for a reason. The constitution sets up two bodies in the legislature for a reason. You know, you, Nebraska has a unicameral legislature. That's fine. Uh, that for, for their reasons and for their history, that works for them. But Alaska has two bodies, two co-equal bodies. Um, and, and for, the house to, to, to bend over and, and follow the Senate's uh, crony capitalist top 20% driven, take it out of the hides of middle and lower income Alaska families budget. I, I just think it's um, I think it's just a, uh, it would be a horrible mistake. So let's hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> let's hope, let's hope Ben's, Ben's wrong. Let's hope Ben's. I no. mean, we can always pray, but uh, yeah, he's down there in the trenches. He may have a better view from there, but yeah, let's, let's hope that yeah, he's wrong. All right. So, so what, so what, what's the need needs to be in the governor's call? If the governor calls a special session, which appears likely it would take the legislature two thirds of both bodies to call themselves back into session. Uh, if the governor calls it into special session, he sets the agenda. And, and one set of proposals or one set of thought has been that the governor just, you know, calls the special session on the budget, um, probably includes the, the 404, the, the core of the, the water permit thing as well. But if he just sets it on the, on the budget as it's been um, and tries to define that as the scope of the special session, I'm not sure we get any place. The problem, the problem we have in this legislature right now is the Republicans the House majority has put themselves in the situation where the only way they they can they can they pay for the rep the pay they pay for the PFD. The only way they they get the revenues to pay for the PFD is by is through uh, draining uh, 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 savings, essentially taxing future Alaskan generations uh, and letting this generation off the hook entirely. Um, the way the Republicans get some balance in the, the way the house majority gets some balance in this, in this process is to, is to work on, uh, revenue measures and to say, look, you know, we're not going to drain and, and to have some vision that says we're not going to drain savings forever. Hey, we don't have enough savings to drain forever, but we're not going to drain savings forever. We've got these revenue measures that we're working on. We're going to advance, uh, that are going to offset, uh, some of the uh, 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 some of the cost of of, of government uh, and have current the current generation pay for some of the cost of government. So it's to to get to get the leverage they need, I think, to get the Senate to move on or to to create a uh, a process to get the Senate to move on the on the dividend. Uh, I think the Republicans have to have have to be making progress on some revenue measures. Ben's got a revenue measure in uh, in House Ways and Means. The sales tax, not perfect, as you and I have talked about before, but at least it's a revenue measure in House Ways and Means. It's a it's a way of fixing this. Uh, the Senate's got a revenue measure uh, in terms of the Hill Corp, in terms of oil taxes, generally, but but specifically in terms of the Hill Corp uh, closing the Hill Corp loophole. And and I think we need to have that as part of the discussion in the special session, as part of the progress that can be made in the special session uh, to get toward, uh, to get toward uh, uh, a balance on the PFD. I don't, I, I will agree with Bert on this. I don't think the PFD moves as long as we're, as long as we're talking about the, the only place that it's going to come from is going to be from future Alaska generations through draining savings more. I don't think that we're going to get, much movement on the PFD. And if we're, if we're in, and if we, you know, go at it another 30 days, I, I tend to agree with Bert that we're going to be at the same place at the end of that 30 days. Okay. I think, I think the thing that moves it forward is if there's some discussion of revenues to, to have current, the current generation pay for a part of the cost of a part of the cost of government, um, have the top 20% have non-residents pay for a part of the cost of government. And I think that needs to be in the call. Can I, can I say that I think we fall into that classic trap uh, 
The first, of course, which is to never get involved in a land war in Asia. The second, which is they've decided to change the verbiage again, because remember, the permanent fund dividend is supposed to be paid out of the earnings reserve account. And you could pay it out of the earnings reserve account. And then you'd have to pay for a government out of other sources because that's what they're doing. They're taking it first out of the earnings reserve and then saying, oh, there's not enough money for the PFD. Well, the PFD is supposed to be first call on the earnings reserve. And it's yeah. like, so we've fallen into the same trap of saying, well, they're paying for it out of savings. No, they're misappropriating it. Not out, They're not taking it out of the proper source. And the thing is, then government uh, operations and everything else would have to come out of savings. So I'm, you're, you're right. I'm just saying this is how they're this is how they're shaping and molding the argument. Now we're arguing about over where we're going to pull this money from when it should come out of the earnings reserve to begin with, and we should be figuring out how we're going to pay for the rest of government based on that. That's fine. I mean, uh, you, uh, I mean, maybe may, 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 yeah. maybe a proper way to phrase it is. Uh, in order to get them to stop taxing the PFD, which is what they're doing to pay for government, there needs to be another revenue source in order to avoid uh, using PFD cuts to pay for government, which is what they're doing. Most regressive yeah. tax ever. In order to get them to avoid doing that, there needs to be a substitute revenue source. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, so I mean, again, I wasn't trying to split hairs. I'm just saying this is how it's led us to this point. And this is this is the argument that we're now in over this. So, but I agree with you. I mean, the governor. So what if you were governor, what would what would your call be? What would you what would the status and the and the subject of your call be specifically? And what would you avoid quickly? Here? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd put the budget uh, uh, certainly on and he's going to have to put the budget on the on the call. But I'd also put revenue measures. Um, uh, oil tax revenue measures. They could be the revenue measures that are currently in the body. Uh, I'd love to see a flat tax in the body, but but it's not. Um, and it could be the current revenue measures that are in the body. But there needs to be there needs to be the ability to talk about revenue. If not this year, if not, I mean, you can close the Hillcorp loophole and get it this year. But if not this year, there needs to be the ability to talk about some revenue measures down the road. So what right now, I mean, the House budget, the House budget essentially says uh, we're going to we're going to pay the P. We're going to pay for government. If we want if we want to term this correctly. We're going to pay for government out of uh, 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 draws down on on savings this year and some and some PFD taxes, because remember, they're cutting it from the current right. statutory amount down to POMV 5050. We're going to pay for government this year out of out of drawing down revenue out of drawing down savings. There's nothing on the house side that that you know leads you to that leads you to believe right now that we're not going to be facing that same thing next year and the year after that and the year after that. That's the problem with the house approach. It's not necessarily the drawdown this year. It's that is that there's no end in sight to 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 the need for a drawdown. And so you got to draw the line. You got to draw the line someplace. And so if I were the, if, if I were the governor, I would I would include the budget certainly on the on the call, but I'd also include the revenue measures currently in both bodies, all the revenue measures to give to give maximum flexibility uh, in both bodies. And if the governor wanted to finally come up with this, you know, instead of waiting for Godot never to come, <laughs> the governor want, finally wanted to contribute his proposed sales tax to it. That'd be great, too. Uh, let's let's see what it is. Let's see where it varies from uh, what Ben's proposed. But right. there needs there needs to be revenue measures on 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 the call, or else we've just locked in on you know this butting heads throughout the next throughout the next uh, thirty days or whatever the special session is. Quickly, because we're up against the break. But what about calling a special session specifically to create a fiscal plan that includes all those things? I mean, should it be the title of it be finding a long term fiscal plan, or I mean, what 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 say you real quickly on that? Well, we're probably talking about two special sessions. We got to get the FY twenty four budget done. Yeah. Um, and and so, you know, if you wanted to try to throw in the long term fiscal plan, that would be great. But that's probably better set aside for something another, another one later okay. in the year. I made a vein throb in Brad's forehead. Uh, it was <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean to get down into semantics on you on that. But I, I mean, I could just I all of a sudden I had this 10,000 foot view of look, they've got us arguing over the things that they've been pushing all this time. I mean, it again, it, 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 it is a little bit of semantics and splitting hairs, but at the same time, this is the slow and subtle way that they change the conversation. And that's just terrifying to me. Well, I don't, I don't disagree with that, Michael, but it's shorthand, right? I mean, that, yeah, that's, no. where, that, that's where we are to, yeah. to get, to get movement from the Senate. 
you're going to have to show that there's that there's substitute revenues. Now, you know, they would phrase it as substitute revenues or revenues to support the PFD. You and I'd phrase it as substitute revenues to, to support government spending levels uh, because the PFD is separately funded. But it, it's it, it comes it ends up in the same place, unfortunately, uh, which is that, that there needs to be substitute revenues There needs to be revenues for some purpose. Uh, All right. And, and and you can't, you know, I, on on you know, back in the mid 2020 teens, uh, you know, that was an important distinction because about you know what it was for, what those revenues were for, because we were trying to focus people on cutting government costs, right, and saying, look, you've got to raise revenues to 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 pay for government and get people to push back on increasing government costs. I, you know, I don't know about you, but I but. I don't. I don't think there's much cutting go, that's going to that's going to go right. on uh, uh, in, in the FY24 budget or even in the in the in the future yeah. budgets. Hell, this legislation this this session has been all about where we're going to increase. I mean, we're going to yeah. increase on K through 12. We're going to increase on defined benefits. We're going to increase here. We're going to increase there. And we're going to have you know state supported child care now. Um, it, it, it's all been a bit about increases. And there's been you know Rob Myers as few amendments. Because he tried to, you know, he tried to pick the most obvious examples. Rob Myers' few amendments all got defeated by huge numbers. So, yeah, uh, Rob Myers says something else uh, in regards to me saying, "Should we include a fiscal plan in the thing?" And you said it probably is a second special session. Although Rob points out that uh, once the budget passes, the chance to pass the fiscal plan passes. That literally, you got to have the levers of both. You have to have the leverage of holding the budget hostage to be able to get them to actually acknowledge a fiscal plan, which based on their reactions to everything else, this entire session is probably not wrong. They have really no interest in, especially the Senate, they have no interest in passing any kind of long-term fiscal plan. Um, and they have no, they have no interest in factoring the consequences, the unintended consequences of their actions in the future. Uh, they don't care. Uh, it seems like what the long-term uh, uh, thing is going to be that the PFD is going to be gone, that there's going to be taxes, that things are going to increase. They're not, as long as the government economy is healthy, Alaska is healthy in their opinion. I mean, that was, that was Ben Carpenter's point yesterday. Yeah. Ben alluded to that by talking about holding up the budget. You know, if we, the Senate has to agree on certain uh, pieces of the fiscal plan, like a spending cap and other things. Ben alluded to that yesterday and I, and I see the logic for it. But boy, that's a long special session <laughs> at the end of a regular session that didn't that didn't advance the ball much uh, on that topic. I mean, we haven't we haven't gotten any pieces of the fiscal plan even out of um, uh, House Finance, and several pieces of the fiscal plan are still back in House Ways and Means. So you're talking about going from you're talking about a special session that you would then say has to go from zero to a hundred. Um, in, in, in 30 days, 30 days that's coinciding with, you know, everybody and all the tourists coming into judo and all the, all the disruption that creates going from zero to 130 days when we couldn't get it done in 120 days. So you couldn't even get, couldn't even get the ball advanced out of one body in 120 days. So it's, uh, it's asking a lot. I, I, I appreciate the point that Rob's making. I appreciate the point that Ben made yesterday, um, but we better be prepared to be here for a while uh, if uh, if that's uh, if that's the process we're going to go through. And then Gary in the chat room makes a comment, which I think is probably indicative of many um, Republicans who are probably closer to the top 20 percent and who don't really understand the uh, genesis of the PFD itself. He said, how did Alaskans live before the PFD is around? Did everyone live in homeless camps and eat in food lines? I'm sure people survived just fine. However, most did not buy a new ATV or car every year like they did after the start of the PFD. Just getting rid of the PFD once and for all and right into the law, the budget could never grow over the annual amount of those earnings. Populations have been falling year after year, the size of the budget, yada, yada, yada. Uh, basically saying, I'll just give up the PFD and it'll be fine. Um, which, uh, first of all, I'll tell you right now, I've never bought an ATV or a new car every year when I got my PFD. My PFD paid for heating oil. It paid for food. It paid for new tires for my car. It helped me pay off my my house uh, or pay off down payment on my house. That's I mean, that's a I mean, that's a ridiculous statement in that regard. Uh, yeah, I don't think a, you should give it up. 
it's a caricature of what of what the PFD is used for, and and people use people in the top twenty point percent use that point to try to you know belittle the PFD. But but Michael, you're much more representative of what people uh, use the PFD for. All right, give us a thirty second tease here of number two. Where do we go from here, Brad? Hit it. Well, we've, we're starting to talk about it. It's sort of a smooth transition from one to the other. Where do we go from here? What's the what's what's the legislature got to do? What to to progress this process? forward what's the what's the uh house got to do specifically to progress this process forward what's the senate got to do to progress this process forward uh we're going to talk a little bit about where we go from here we're getting into the uh second of the weekly top three which is where do we go from here uh that was a very interesting comment maybe i guess we'll get to it in the break or whatever but uh brad i'll let you take the floor number two where, where are we at well the house has to house has to work through its fiscal plan i mean the, the disarray in the House is, is disappointing and really undermining the House's position uh, on the PFD because they've got they've got no substitute revenues. I mean, to, to sustain the PFD, whether whether you characterize it as paying for the PFD or paying for government in lieu of PFD taxes, taxes on the PFD, one way or another, we've got to come up with a substitute source of revenue. And 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 for the House's position both this year, frankly, I think, and long term, the House has got to come up with a credible position on what we're going to do uh, if we if we stop, you know, relying on on PFD cuts. If we stop relying on PFD taxes um, uh, uh, going forward, and and it's not it's not come up with that credible position. I mean, it's 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 sort of <laughs> we talked about this last week in terms of you know advancing pieces as opposed as opposed to a whole plan uh, at one time. But the pieces are in disarray. I mean, it's got the the PFD, the constitutionalizing the PFD is sitting in House Finance. I think, uh, heck, it still may be back in House House Ways and Means, but I think it's in House Finance. Uh, the spending cap, which uh, which is a, a component of it, not the most important component, but a component of it. The spending cap uh, made it out of Ways and Means, made it to House Finance, and then it imploded when a Republican of all people tried to uh, tr- propose to amend it to increase. Uh, the 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 cap to buy another billion dollars, uh, and essentially allow additional government spending. Um, so it's not even it's not made it out of House Finance. And then the and then the 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 other component of it, the 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 revenues, the replacement revenues, the substitute revenues, those haven't made it out of out of House Ways and Means. Ben said he was going to bring it up for a vote uh, last uh, Friday night, so presumably he's got the votes to advance it. Uh, or he wouldn't he wouldn't bring it up, but but it hasn't made it out of House Ways and Means, and certainly hasn't made it through House Finance. The Republicans right. to 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 get this thing framed in a way that's going to make progress. The Republicans have got to build a credible plan. And as of as of where we sit right now, the the House majority just doesn't hasn't done that. Um, so going forward, uh, a particularly important piece to push back on the Senate to push back on those who say. We're just going to use PFD cuts to fund government. Uh, the House has got to build a credible plan, uh, a credible fiscal plan to, to to be out there and pushing. I mean, it's too easy for the Senate now. The, the Senate says, look, we're going with a balanced budget. Um, you guys don't have a credible plan on how to get to a balanced budget. Uh, and so we're the balanced budget guys. We're the real fiscal. They're not. But, you know, they claim that we're, we're the real fiscal conservatives because we got a balanced budget, balanced on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah. But we got a balanced budget. First time in 12 years yeah. we've been interested in a balanced budget, but this year is the year we're right. we found right. but, but but at least but but they're saying that. And the house the house has no comeback to that right now. The house says, well, we're just gonna drain savings by another amount. Well, that's not a long-term plan. It's not even a short-term plan, to tell you the truth, because we're down to the point where we don't have that much savings left. So it's it's the house has got to me, the onus is on the house to get its act together. To, to, to get around a fiscal plan, get it out there on the table, get it, get all of the component pieces, at least through ways and means, uh, if not all the way through House Finance, and then be prepared to push back on the Senate and say, look, and here's where the debate should be. Here's where, where, where we start gaining if the debate's this. Look, you want to fund government on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFT cuts. <coughs> We want to fund government fairly. All Alaskans contributing 
uh, uh, in some amount, in some significant amount, to the to the cost of government. And then then we've got a debate. Then we've got a debate that, frankly, you know, you we will find that the House minority is closer to the House if the House majority is able to to build that. We'll find that the House minority is closer to the House majority than they are to the Senate, because the House minority instinctively is going to want to look for fairness for middle and lower income Alaska families. They're going to want to right. look for strength in the Alaska economy. So if the House majority, <coughs> I'm sorry, if the House majority can get their act together and get that package together, I think you find the House minority sort of gravitates toward the House majority position and away from the Senate position. But as long as, as long as the House majority doesn't have that sort of balanced long-term, short-term and long-term position. You know, the Senate is the is has has the only game in town in terms of being able to talk about a balanced budget. So right. it's the 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 real, I, I think going forward, the real emphasis, the real focus, the real weight ought to be on the House majority to get their act together on uh, on the fiscal plan. To have the full fiscal plan, to have it out, to engage the minority in it, and to get it going. All right. Well, that brings us to number three, which is uh, your belief that Alaska is still, in many ways, a colony. Uh, the colony of Alaska, which uh, some of us have argued that for years. But uh, give me your take on why Alaska is still a colony. I tell you, the Hill, the Hill Corp uh, loophole has just, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just amazed that there are people trying to defend the little, the Hillcorp loophole. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the op-ed by the head of the Iditarod, which Hillcorp held fund, helped fund <coughs> about how important maintaining the Hillcorp loophole is. And then, and then we saw Jeff Landfield write an article in the, uh, essentially an op-ed in the Alaska landmine defending the Hillcorp loophole. And we've seen, <coughs> sorry, we've seen other people uh, trying to defend the Hillcorp loophole. That's just silly. It's just silly. I mean, the hundred billion dollars is dropping to Hillcorp's profit. Hillcorp is trying to threaten Alaska by saying, "Well, if we don't get that hundred million, that extra hundred million, you know, we're not going to have as as robust a drilling program in the Cook Inlet as we otherwise would." The Hillcorp, the, the hundred million has no relationship to the Cook Inlet. The Cook Inlet, Inlet is hardly taxed. There's royalty relief in the in the in the Cook Inlet. The economics of the Cook Inlet work. The legislature in the past has taken steps that make the economics of the Cook Inlet work. Hill Corp has all the incentive in the world to go ahead and, and engage in activities in the Cook Inlet. Alaska gas sells for multiple times higher than lower 48 gas. The incentives are to make investment in Alaska, develop the gas, sell it at Alaska prices. <coughs> There's no way in the world the $100 million uh, of the Hill Corp loophole is tied to the Cook Inlet. Yet, we have people running around saying, oh, my God, you know, we can't we can't tax Hillcorp in the same way we taxed BP because Hillcorp would lose one hundred million dollars. And so they might not do things, do things with it. That hundred million dollars is just profit to to the Hillcorp shareholder uh, and the Hillcorp owners. And and it is profit that's not necessary to get them to incentivize them to develop in Alaska. It's also windfall profit. When they did the transaction with BP, as we talked about before, when somebody does an acquisition, they have two lists, a list of the things that are absolutely necessary to get the deal done to make the economics work, and a list of things that would be great if somehow they fell in place. Believe me, the Hillcorp loophole, the S-Corp treatment, was on the second list, was on the list of, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if Alaska was so stupid that they never taxed us the way they tax, the way they tax other C-Corps? Um, and, and that hundred million dollars is just dropping to the Hill Corp's bottom line. If we can't, if the legislature can't get the guts to close the loop, the close the Hill Corp loophole, loophole and take that hundred million dollars over to Alaskans, if they can't get the guts to do that, then, then we are an oil colony. I mean, cause we, cause we, cause we are not thinking about Alaskans first. We're thinking about just giving money away when some oil company makes some claim about some, you know, benefit that 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 they're going to provide us showers with uh, if they get an extra hundred million dollars. Yeah. My my but my favorite argument that I've heard so far, by favorite I mean most ridiculous, is the argument that is well, when they bought it, 
they knew they they expected this to happen in perpetuity and so we shouldn't change although i've never seen an argument where some corporation came into alaska under a certain tax structure and that guaranteed them forever in perpetuity that the tax structure in the state would never change on corporations of any kind it just happens because this is hill corp and and they're threatening the whole cook inlet gas thing and all that i mean i that is the most ridiculous argument like you can never expect it to change in the future do well, it my- all the time and Michael, oil oil company 101. I mean, I used to teach courses on, on legal structure, regulatory structure, right? Oil company 101 is it will change. Create create flexibility in your economics to accommodate the fact that governments will change, government programs will change. You know, make it robust as at, 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 at various levels because the government will change those levels. And if we go through <laughs> if we go through difficult times and we stop investing in a certain area, as happened with the oil companies in the late 20, 2000s, uh, the you should expect the government to change to reduce the the take so that it, it reincentivizes investment. It will change. That's that's oil company one hundred and one. And for Hillcorp to make that argument is just for I don't Hillcorp can make that argument for people to believe people in the legislature to believe that argument. They don't belong in the legislature. They belong someplace else. Well, again, we talked about it yesterday. There's a lot of willful blindness going on, I think, in uh, in in these cases. Uh, Sherry just says, Brad, honestly, just wow. Hillcorp is doing the dirty work for Alaskans. Who do you suggest monetizing Alaskan oil and gas? Hillcorp will continue doing it, Sherry. Just we say. don't need to pay them an extra $100 million to do it. They will do it based upon the economics of SB 21 that we passed in in, in 2013, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's we're giving them a hundred million dollars simply because of the way that their corporation is organized. Right. And if you want to give them a hundred million dollars, give them a hundred million dollars out of your pocket. Right. Don't give them a hundred million dollars out of middle and lower income Alaska families who are bearing the costs as a result of the deeper PFD cuts that we're making in order to fund that hundred million dollars that Hill Corp otherwise should be paying. Right. Uh, Brian said, it's a sad day. Harold, Harold isn't here to hear that last statement from Brad, where if you can't find a $100 million cut from Phil Corp, then, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you're this is an oil and gas guy talking, saying this is should be expected. This is not, I mean, they can cry and whine all they want, but you can guarantee it's factored into their plan somewhere. Oh, absolutely. It's factored into their plan. Absolutely. It was in their, it was in their economics. I mean, BP, look, BP wanted out of Alaska for a variety of reasons. They wanted to monetize Alaska and, and, and go on with their life uh, someplace else. They were, you know, talk about round heels. We've talked about the government governor having round heels and just giving and giving and giving. BP was giving and giving and giving. I mean, Hillcorp, Hillcorp couldn't come up with enough things to ask. From from BP uh, 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 to you know to to get BP out of here fast enough, so it's so that hundred million dollars, Michael clearly was a win is clearly is a windfall to to to, to Hill Corp. Now they're trying to justify it and they're trying to make defenses and they're trying to threaten you know if they'll shut down the Cook Inlet or shut down their exploration program or whatever they're threatening to do if they don't get that extra hundred million dollars. But come on, it's a hundred million dollars that BP was paying. <clears throat> that the other majors on the on the on the on the slope are paying and that Hillcorp is getting simply because of its of its different corporate structure. You know, if, if this the reason you don't tax S corps in most in most jurisdictions is because it's a flow through. The the profits flow through the S corp to the individual owners and then the individual owners pay taxes on it at the individual level. Well, what's happening in Alaska, and and that's historically, I mean, S corps were created back when, back when we still had income taxes. That's historically the reason that that you have that in Alaska. So it flows through and is taxed at the at the individual level. Well, we're not taxing we're not taxing Hill Corp at the individual level either. I mean, we don't have an income tax on the on the, on the owners of Hill Corp. So they're getting this tax free, and it's that hundred million dollars tax free. Hundred million dollars in revenue, tax free, and it's just, or yeah, you know, it, it's just, it, it is just ludicrous to think that that is motivating their behavior um, in any way other than to, you know, making them have to make more bank trips to go cash the hundred million dollars, put the hundred million dollars in their banks. 
I, yeah, Sherry, I'm sorry. I'd like you, you know, you and Tom are, are friends. We've agreed on a lot of things, but th that's just stupid. I mean, that's just stupid to think that that hundred million dollars is, is due Hillcourt because they get their hands dirty. They'll right. still be here. They aren't going any place. They're making a heck of a lot of money out of Alaska the way it is. And, and the hundred million dollars is just free money that we, that we're giving them as opposed to being able to distribute it to middle and lower income Alaska families. Well, through PFDs. And I will remind people like Sherry that there, I mean, the, the proviso in the constitution says that the, that the resources in Alaska must be developed to the maximum benefit of the people. And that is a finite resource that they're extracting. I mean, there's only so much of it. So we need to get the maximum benefit to the people uh, in any way possible. And that includes in making it an equitable tax structure. Uh, to, you know, if they had, if another company came in and bought a similar project, but it was a C Corp, it'd pay $100 million more. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that we should be getting the maximum that we can for our oil in every way. I don't think it's the 1.2, 1.3, 1.8 billion dollars that we keep hearing being thrown around. But, you know, 100 million here, 100 million there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. Well, and especially Michael, since we're you know, it's not it's not like it's not like it's reducing savings or anything. It is coming out of that 100 million dollars would go to support the budget would reduce the pressure for for PFD cuts. Would reduce the pressure for taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. So, so the people who are paying Hillcorp that $100 million, the reason Hillcorp's get, continuing to get the $100 million is because middle and lower income Alaska families are taking less in terms of PFDs uh, uh, to, to fund that $100 million that, that Hillcorp's go, doing. You take $100 million, you take that $100 million out of Hillcorp, that's not going to affect their decline curve at all in either the Cook Inlet or uh, up on the slope. SB 21 provides more than enough incentives for them to continue to make investments uh, uh, in both locations. Brad, <laughs> Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, I can tell we touched a nerve with some people. Uh, well, how about taxing all S Corps? Well, I mean, if you know, it, there's again special carve outs for for oil companies specifically in state code to begin with, and this just would equi this would le level the playing field in that regard. But all right, we're we're out of time uh, here uh, with Brad. You, I mean, you could stay and rant all you want, Brad. No. And, you want know, to you want to do it? It's it's no. fine. No, no. Um, I've, I've said my piece. You've said my piece. He's gonna go 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 wet your whistle and get uh, things uh, squared away. All right, Brad. Thank you so much for coming on board today. We appreciate you uh, appreciate you being part of it. Thanks so much, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.